All right, we are open. Let me put my, I think I can switch camera here. Spotlight myself. There we go. Yeah, that looks good, Andy. Thanks. Ward, did Nancy get you a copy of the? Uh, script the the questions she did so, so thank you very much always yeah, helps got like i think six hours worth of questions there so <laughs> gonna be a matter of picking and choosing but uh we'll do our best now joe are you downtown today i'm sorry are you downtown today uh, I, i'm at, at uh, greenfield parkway the uh, mobility and safety but uh yeah I, I come into the office when i really Want, feel like I need better internet connection. And <laughs> sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. I understand. Like, uh, was it last week or week before I was in the office here and we, we actually had a big internet outage, right? If I'd have stayed home, I could have kept, kept working and, you know, came to the office for all the right reasons. And the so ultimate much. frustration. Just about a year ago, my wife and I went to New York uh, before the pandemic, and uh, we sat in on a taping of the uh, Stephen Colbert show. Oh, and uh, these these couple of minutes before they started taping were a bit awkward, just like <laughs> just, just <laughs> like the moment we're having now. No, that's the way it works. No, that's e even in the big town. Yep. Joe, when did you say that you went up there? That was uh, January of 2020. Okay. I actually went to one of those tapings myself back in December of 2019. Ah, of Colbert? Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. It was one of, one of the highlights of my, I don't know, last 20 years. It was, it was really good. It was certainly a highlight of 2020, wasn't it? <laughs> as, as it turned out. <laughs> We keep con congratulating ourselves on our impeccable timing there. Yep. All right. So far, I'm looking at the number of participants we have coming in. We've got in the low 40s. It keeps going up now. So people are starting to filter in. Andy, you're monitoring the Q&A in the chat, right? Correct, yes. Okay. Give it another minute or two as folks get in.
how do we need some theme music? <laughs> <laughs> That's something we can look into for next time. Life is. <laughs> All right, I think we'll go ahead and get going here. I'll switch my video back over. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andy Wagner. I work at HNTV and I'm one of the producers, as I've been told by Dr. Hummer of this Conversations in Transportation series. I wanna welcome everybody. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy days to join us here. A couple of housekeeping announcements before we get started. Uh, first of all, if you didn't see it in the email you received earlier this morning, we will be sending out the PDH and evaluation forms to everybody later this afternoon. Uh, also, if you're looking for a CM credit, you can search Nick's site on the AICP website to do that. Uh, if you have a particular question to ask either now or something you think of throughout the presentation, we ask that you use the Q&A function here on Zoom in order to do that. I'll be monitoring that and uh, moderating the Q&A that we have at the end of the session after we have the conversation. So now that we've taken care of those things, I'm going to turn it on over to Dr. Hummer and Mr. Nye, as I'll get both of you put on the screen. There we go. Good, thanks Andy and uh... Uh, let me uh, say my welcome to uh, all of our participants today. We really appreciate you uh, joining us for this first ever uh, conversation in, in transportation. Uh, we uh, hope this uh, proves to be uh, an enduring series. Uh, the idea here is uh, to have a conversation with transportation industry leaders, uh, interesting people who have uh, uh, had interesting careers and got uh, interesting topics and ideas and we're hoping to appeal to uh, transportation professionals of uh, all ages uh, from our uh, retired members uh, to our uh, student members and everybody in between and uh, really uh, want to uh, thank our sponsors uh, for making this uh, series possible the um, uh, diamond sponsors for uh, North Carolina section ITE uh, were listed on the, the title slide as, as you might have seen on your way in and uh, we really appreciate their, their sponsorship uh, to, to make this possible. Uh, a couple other uh, words of thanks. Uh, the uh, uh, other sponsors of this uh, series are the uh, two councils uh, who have taken this up. That's the uh, Strategic Init Initiative Council and uh, Chair Adam Fisher of Ramey Kempen Associates and the uh, Young Members Council and uh, Chair uh, Christina Whitfield of Kimley Horn. So uh, much thanks to uh, those uh, chairs of those councils. Uh, appreciate their uh, support in uh, getting this series launched. Uh, our guest today is Mr. Ward Nye. Uh, he is the uh, CEO of uh, Martin Marietta, uh, which is a uh, S&P 500 material supplier company uh, headquartered in uh, North Carolina. Uh, and Mr. Nye is also the uh, co-chair of the North Carolina First Commission, which uh, made recommendations to uh, the uh, North Carolina government uh, on future transportation revenue sources. So uh, Ward, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Joe, it's my pleasure to be here. The most dawning thing that I've heard is this is the first one that we've done and that there are going to be evaluations. So. You know, that, that sets the bar a little bit higher than I was looking for here on, a, on a, at noontime, but you know, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for asking me. Uh, th thank you, and uh, rest assured the evaluations are, are more of me than they are of you, so <laughs> we'll, we'll be okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so uh, first, if, if you wouldn't mind uh, telling us what the uh, NC First Commission is. No, happy to do that. The NC First Commission is, is made up of really volunteers from across the state. We were asked to serve by the Secretary of Transportation by the governor. And, and the notion is simply this, uh, transportation is evolving more really over the last 10 years and probably the next 10 years than it has over the last 50. And to the extent that transportation is evolving and to the extent that North Carolina is growing, and I think we believe both of those things will persist, what do we need to do from a transportation and infrastructure perspective to make sure that we're well prepared for changing North Carolina. 
for those of us who are from North Carolina, I'm, I'm a native, I was born and raised here in the Triangle. I remember several years ago when North Carolina passed New Jersey in population, that was almost an unnatural act to even think about. And that makes us the ninth most populous state in the country today. And by the time we get to 2050, I think we're gonna be the seventh most populous state in the country. So with that degree of population inflow coming in, what do we need to do to stay ahead of it? So long story short, the governor and the secretary asked Mayor McFarland here in Raleigh and me to chair the NC First Commission. It was made up of a number of people, Ronnie Chatterjee, who's a professor at Duke, uh, Janet Cowell, who's the former treasurer of North Carolina, Jesse Curitan, who's with Novant Health, Stephen DeMay, who's a senior person at, at Duke Energy, uh, Julie Eisel, who's the mayor pro tem in Charlotte, Peter Hans started out on this when he was running the community colleges in North Carolina. When he got kicked upstairs to Chapel Hill, he said he had a full-time job over there, so he, he had to resign from the committee. Uh, we also had Brenda Wiley, who's the mayor of Banner Elk, Tim Saunders, who runs the Bankers Association here. Sally Shooping Russell is a retired executive at BlackRock. Mike Walden is, is a colleague at, at NC State. You, I'm sure you know Mike well. And Patrick Woody runs the North Carolina Rural Center. So in large measure, you had academics, you had business people, you had people from urban areas, people from rural areas, but everyone with an aim of what can we do to help North Carolina position itself? So hopefully that answers that question. It, it really, really does. Uh, thank you. Yep. The uh, commission delivered its report on January 8th, just about a month ago. Uh, and for those of you uh, looking online, uh, it's easy to find, should be the first thing that comes up in a Google search. There's a report and uh, ha happily for uh, some of us, there's a PowerPoint summary that uh, really captures uh, the essence. So uh, what's been the reaction since January 8th? You know what, the reaction broadly has been pretty good. I'll, I'll tell you that the initial reaction from the governor was, boy, this is a long report. And uh, it is a long report. That's the merciful nature of the PowerPoint presentation. But I will tell you, Nancy and I, number one, felt good about the report as it came together. We had wonderful participation by all members of the committee. It was extraordinarily thoughtful from a process perspective. We spent nearly 19 months initially doing what you would expect data, and then pulling together the report. And what you recognize is whenever you're coming up with a series of funding mechanisms, and, and by that, you're either looking to generate taxes somehow or other revenues. Inevitably, there are gonna be people who look at that and say, well, this really doesn't look like a particularly good idea. I mean, we were, we were ready for that. We've heard very little of that. I think what we're hearing with varying degrees of consistency is we understand the need. I think the debate that we're gonna have in North Carolina is not around the need, it's around how exactly are we going to do it as you'll see when you go through the report, or if you look at the PowerPoint slides, we made a recommendation and then we made a, a series of findings. The recommendation was in North Carolina, if we look at transportation and infrastructure, and we even look at it as the American Society of Civil Engineers would grade it. You know, we're, we're sitting here with something that feels mediocre. And there are a lot of things that we can say about North Carolina, but we've never been a state that's been all about mediocre. We've, we've been about considerably more than that. So our recommendation was to up the investment in infrastructure to the point that it goes from mediocre to good. Mm -hmm. and, and there were two different studies that were going on, Joe, almost in parallel, what the NC First Commission was doing. And then there was also a, a study that was being done by ITRI on behalf of the North Carolina Chamber Foundation. And what we ended up looking at, we looked at their report, we obviously did our own research. So our recommendation was we needed to minimally put $20 billion more in highways, bridges, roads, streets, infrastructure, including broadband over the next decade than we're putting in today. So that was the recommendation. Now, what we did behind the recommendation is we offered a series of options. And as I said, when you, you said, how did people react to it? We didn't want to come forward with recommendations on how to do it. We wanted to give the legislature and the governor and the secretary a series of options that they could almost use in, in some sort of a menu to help get to the bottom line dollar amount. Because I'm sure we're going to talk through some of the options, but it was hard to get unanimity 
on any one option, as you would imagine. So at the end, the recommendation was 20 billion over 10 years, and then a series of options. And, and there's a, a do nothing option is really not feasible with, with, without, without doing something, uh, transportation in North Carolina is just gonna wither away, right? Well, it's certainly not going to be where it should be. And, it, and it, we're not gonna have a transportation system, one that's worthy of what this state deserves. And it's not gonna have us in a position that we can remain competitive. And, and that's one of the issues that we have to be sensitive to. Number one, people are moving to the state because they're expecting a certain quality of life. So we, we start with that notion. They move to the state expecting a certain level of safety on the highways. If we look at our rural road fatalities, that's not a percentage that we need to be particularly proud of. But we also want people moving here to either create or grow new businesses. We want that because it's gonna be a strong revenue factor for North Carolina. It's also gonna create jobs because one of the things that we do extraordinarily well is educate people. And we wanna make sure we have an educated workforce. And when we have that workforce, we wanna have a job for them to go to here in the state. So uh, I, I think oftentimes what's missed is the criticality between investment in infrastructure and, and really what the outcome of that is relative to people, relative to jobs, relative to quality of life. So a do nothing strategy to your point, Joe, is, is not an acceptable place for the state to be. What, what did the commission uh, foresee as the, the uh, pattern going forward if we, if we did nothing? I'll put this in geotechnical terms that relevant maybe to your company. Um, what was the, the, were the revenues going to see a gradual erosion or a sudden slope failure? You know, it's always interesting. Whenever there's a sudden slope failure, we know it's a gradual erosion and you just don't see the gradual erosion, right? Okay. So I, I, I think our view is clearly if we look at the sheer number of bridges that are deficient, it, it, again, if we look at secondary roads, uh, if we look at interstates, they tend to be in reasonably good shape. Uh, the bigger issue with some of the interstates is simply going to be the volume of traffic that we're looking at. So our, our sense was, again, the do-nothing approach was not going to have us where we needed to be. We would have something that would move from mediocre to something worse than mediocre in a relatively short period of time. Uh, for those of you who may be in the contracting community, you know, for, for a period of almost a year and a half, there have been little to any asphalt paving projects that have been let in North Carolina because of the circumstance that DOT has found itself in uh, due to a series of really exogenous events that, that put them there. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I think that underscores why we were careening in a direction that was unhealthy and not sustainable. And uh, are, are the uh, folks listening in from uh, cities uh, at risk as well? This isn't just a state problem. No, it, it, it's, not just a, it's not just an urban problem, it, it, nor is it a rural problem. It, it, it's simply a problem. And, and I, I do think it's more exacerbated in some parts of the far eastern and far western parts of North Carolina. They have clearly not benefited from at least the economic recovery that we saw up until COVID's arrival. And what was, what was odd in part on that recovery, Joe, and, and I think it ties back to some of what we're talking about, at least in, in my lifetime, that's been the first economic expansion period that was truly not construction led. So here, here's some things to think about. We clearly know, for example, from the federal government side, we haven't seen a notable increase in infrastructure spend in over 15 years. And, and we know the gas tax, which funds much of that federally, has not been changed. I guess the last time the gas tax was modified was in Bill Clinton's first term as president, so that, that tells us it's been a while. Um, equally, even if we look at housing, it's fascinating to me to look at a housing market in the United States today, because there's this notion that housing is going to break funds. Housing's not bad, but a 50-year average on housing starts in the United States is 1.5 million. We're, we're nowhere near a 50-year average today, despite the fact that the population is considerably more and then even as we look at non-residential construction today, if, if you're Amazon and you're building a fulfillment center, you may have a lot of activity underway. On the other hand, if you're looking to build a hotel or a shopping center, you know, that, that's not a very buoyant market. So 
again, if, if we look at overall activity, it, it's been very sporadic, whether that's urban or rural. But again, the rural parts did not enjoy that last economic uptick at all. Very good, good. Uh, let's start talking about some of the specific um, uh, taxes and fees. Sure. Um, and in, in grad school, I had a class on taxes uh, and, and they taught us the ease. We, we evaluate uh, taxes uh, based on uh, effectiveness. Does it raise enough money? Uh, efficiency, so how, how costly is it to collect? Uh, evasion. Uh, erosion, is it steady with time or does it decline? Uh, equity, uh, and then economic competitiveness. I think that's six E's altogether. So yeah. that sound like a familiar list. Are those, were those the kind of things you all were looking at as well? It was, it, it was. And, and part of what I think helps a lot when you pull a group of people together that's as diverse as this team was, they're going to be looking through it, looking at these issues through a number of lenses, whether it's urban, rural, um, academics, business, or otherwise. And there's a great deal of sensitivity to all of that. Um, and, and so part of what we were very focused on, to your point, was raw efficiencies and, and fundamental fairness. Part of what we're struggling with, and, and it was fascinating as we, as we watched the debate, I think one of the primary themes that we felt very strongly about is to the extent that the gas taxes helped get us from a very rural state back a century ago to something that, that looks very different today. That has been a very good, no pun intended, vehicle to get us there, but it won't finish the journey for us. But, it, but equally, if you think about it, Joe, from an efficiency perspective, you're going to the pump, you're filling up with gas, and the fact is that gas tax is being paid to the state and the federal government immediately. You don't even see it. it it's it's incredibly efficient and it's there and it can flex to a degree. The dilemma that we're seeing is people are driving fewer miles, cars are getting better mileage. And, and then you also have this slow steady movement to electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, et cetera. So the notion was, we know the gas tax is not going to be our long-term friend. So what will be the different vehicles that we can use that will be efficient, that will be fair and at the end of the day, we'll meet the needs that we have in North Carolina, because my guess is you feel like a lot of us do, and that is, hey, I pay a lot in taxes. I'd, I'd like to pay less in taxes, not more in taxes. At the same time, really, we're going to pay for it one way or another. And, and I think we're, we're having to pick and choose right now. But the, the, the ease, we're certainly a part of the dialogue, and, and we think an important part of it. Very good. Good. Uh, you, you the commission split its menu into uh, immediate and long-term menu items. I, maybe we could think of those as the entrees and the dessert. I don't know, but uh, it, it, does that mean for, for the immediate items that those are the things you, you'd really like to see the legislature and the governor work on this session? Let's get going. Yeah, we, we'd like to see it. We'd like to see a number of those addressed sooner rather than later. Um, it's so easy to kick these items down the road. And the other thing that I think we're all aware of, let's face it, when we started this undertaking, we were not in a pandemic environment. When we finished this undertaking, we were in a pandemic environment. And so what we recognize is the cheese got moved a little bit. I mean, are, are people more concerned today than ever before about healthcare and assuring that there are vaccines and assuring that there's equity with respect to the vaccines? There's no, no question about that. So when you show up at the legislature and say, hey, we'd really like to talk to you about highways, bridges, roads, and streets, and you've got people who are afraid for their health, you know, that, that's not necessarily the, the right moment to have a, a broad infrastructure conversation. But the fact is, there will never be a right moment for that. It's, it's always the right moment. If there's one thing that I would really encourage the people who are joining us for this dialogue to do today, is to take this conversation, which is one, because of what we do for a living and, and what you watch, this tends to be something that this little corner of us who, who live in this world understand and have a great deal of passion around. But the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker who, who don't think about this every day don't recognize how important the issue is, which tells us that the voices on this line today can really help move the dial for us. And, and what would I be saying? 
please talk to your members of, of our General Assembly and talk to the people in the executive portion of our government and otherwise, because this is a conversation that needs to have urgency and it does need to have action. And it tends to be relatively bipartisan. Mm -hmm. If we speak to the leaders of the Senate or the leaders of the House or Governor Cooper, that they will all concur that something has to be done on this and they'll concur something has to be done soon. We just need to give them encouragement to do that. Maybe we can even dovetail with some federal momentum on, on infrastructure. I, you know, I certainly hope so. Um, it's been fascinating to watch on the federal side of it for the last few years, because if we go back in time, in 2019, the Senate, and of course the Committee of Jurisdiction in the Senate is the EPW, so that's the Environment Public Works Committee. And the EPW came out in 2019 looking at the FAST Act, which is the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act. And they said, okay, look, we need to invest more than this. And a Republican controlled Senate came out with a proposal that was 28% above the FAST Act. So Republican controlled EPW, 28% up. Um, I gotta tell you that, that felt like a really good number. It was fascinating to watch it in 20 because it got, got kicked over to the other side of the Capitol. The House looked at it and the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee came out with their proposal. That was 42% up. So what I would tell you is, is maybe those set the buoys for us from a federal level. If you've got 28% up in the Senate, 42% up in the House, maybe they meet somewhere in the middle going through a conference committee. But in any respect, we haven't seen that type of movement in over 15 years. So keep in mind, when the predecessor to the FAST Act expired, we went for a decade without a long-term federal highway bill. In other words, we lurched literally for a decade from one continuing resolution at the federal level to another. And then when the FAST Act came in, the general view was, all right, we're not gonna get more money. Let's at least get more time. So they basically took where the latest CR had been and put five years to it because that allows departments of transportation, as you know, Joe, at least the ability to plan and award some projects instead of thinking, well, good, goodness gracious, I've got a CR that's going to end in the next 45 days. What do I do with that except some degree of maintenance and repair? If we get a federal partnership out of this, and I think we will in 21 being in a position that we can leverage that going forward for North Carolina is really important. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's hope, Let, let's hope. Um, oh, let's more than hope, call those Congress people. <laughs> Tell them we need to see a long-term infrastructure yeah. bill, Joe. Let's make it happen, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the immediate uh, menu items uh, in your report was the, uh, an increase of the highway use tax yeah. uh, by, by 2%. So. Can you start out by reminding us what the highway use tax is? Yes, yeah, so the highway use tax is, is basically a tax of 2% in North Carolina on the sale of, of most vehicles. So if you're buying a car from a dealership, there's going to be a highway use tax that, that comes from the sale of that vehicle. We looked at that relative to how does the North Carolina highway use tax look as we compare it to our neighboring states. And, and then we looked beyond that. And, and what we found is that the highway use tax, at least from a neighboring state perspective, was really quite low in North Carolina. So we tried to bring some parity to it. Now, look, we're, we're back to that notion of we're, we're looking at a highway use tax through the lens of how does it look compared to our, our neighboring states. And, and we feel like it needed a bump. And at the same time, if you're a car dealer, you don't feel like it needs a bump. So we're, we're, we're back to that concept, Joe. Not everybody's gonna be happy with, with what we've suggested, but in the final analysis today, we're disproportionately funded by two things, by what's going on relative to a gas tax and what's going on with respect to the highway use tax. Mm -hmm. So our view was, let's take the highway use tax, bump it up to a level that's more consistent with our neighbors that gets it up to that 5%-ish number. And, and that actually brings in pretty considerable revenue to the Department of, of, of DOT. And again, we're back to the ease that you outlined before, you know, what's the efficiency of it, et cetera. And, and we felt like that's a mechanism that's in place. We don't have to put new infrastructure there for it. We know how it works. 
it hasn't been adjusted in a long time. And, and that's what really it, at least drew us to, again, that recommendation. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Uh, the, the second one on the list, at least in the, the PowerPoint presentation, was the uh, was an increase in sales tax. Yeah. And at least from the presentation, I wasn't clear, uh, is that a sales tax uh, uh, on all goods or is it uh, more targeted? You know what, it's basically the sales tax as it's as it's um, defined today in North Carolina. Okay. So, so there are obviously some things that are exempt from a sales tax and, and they would continue to be. I will confess to you that that was probably one of the more significant debates that, that the group had. And, and you had very different views of how to go about that. You had some people whose view, and I understand it, is the sales tax tends to be incredibly regressive. Let, let's be careful with what we do with that. There were others who had the view, and I get this too, you have to, you have to broaden the base. And we have to recognize that nothing gets to market in North Carolina and nothing's getting to your home, to your place of work without utilizing the transportation network here. And so in, in the final analysis, I, I would submit to you, this was one of the reasons that I think we came forward with a series of options rather mm -hmm. than a series of recommendations because it was gonna be hard to get, again, unanimity around a recommendation on a sales tax, but it was easy to get people saying, look, that, that needs to be an option that the legislature looks at and will debate. So I, I think longer term, there, there are a couple of things that strike me. It, it, it occurs to me longer term from a public policy perspective, having the base broader, utilizing a sales tax, leveraging its efficiency makes a lot of sense. At the same time, one of the things that the commission felt some degree of fidelity towards was maintaining a degree of user pays. I mean, so, the, so the view is if you're wearing out the roads, somehow you need to be paying for the wearing out of the roads. But and that might be jumping ahead a little bit, but that, that at least, Joe, was some of the philosophy uh, behind the recommendation relative to the sales tax. Yeah, that, that's, that's another way that equity cuts, isn't it? I mean, equity often these days is, is equated with uh, uh, lower income yep. uh, people, but uh, equity could also mean, yes, use your pays or pay, pay your fair share, or yep. however that's defined. So equity that, that I think most of us were thinking through on that goes back to the notion of fundamental fairness. What, what just strikes us as fundamentally fair. And the other thing that we were very focused on, Joe, was finding what we felt like was going to be a North Carolina solution. Mm -hmm recognize that the issue Carolina has and the issue that Wyoming may have may be very different. Because I think one of the things that members of our commission were most surprised by when we looked at it is the sheer number of miles that NCDOT is responsible for maintaining. And I, I see you nodding affirmatively because you, you get the joke on that. The, you know, the answer is we're, yes. we're, we're number two. And, and, and the state who's number one on, on maintained miles is Texas. And when you look at the difference in the size of Texas geographically and the difference in the population, you kind of get it. But if we go back in time, and this I'll concede this was before my time, but I think it was Governor Hodges who took what at the time was a very progressive view. And that was, I don't want someone to leave their home in North Carolina and travel for more than two miles before they find a paved road. Now, when we think about that notion today, that, that, that feels like, well, of course, at the time that was pretty revolutionary. But what that meant was we paved a lot of roads. And what it meant is NCDOT took responsibility for those roads. And so now today, when we look at an outsized network in North Carolina that has roads, that has rails, that has ports and intercon interconnectivity between all of it, it's a big system that we have to take care of and taking care of it means investment. Speak, speaking of systems, one thing that caught my eye was the uh, a sales tax on uh, transportation network companies. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, if you could explain what, what those are and, and why that's on the menu. Well, so, so really we're looking at some of these firms, whether it's Lyft, Uber, others. We're even looking at that last mile of it. I mean, what, what's happening with scooters in, in some of the big cities? Because we're, we're back to that concept that you and I were discussing at the very beginning of this, Joe. And that is 
there's been so much change in transportation over the last 10 years. I mean, if we were having this conversation, number one, we would have had this conversation 10 years ago because Zoom didn't exist. And, and But if we were, we and somebody said, well, Joe, tell me about all those scooters in Raleigh, you would have said, what in the world are you talking about, scooters in Raleigh? And um, But now they're ubiquitous in Raleigh and Charlotte and, and many other large cities filling that last mile. So again, looking at transportation network companies that have just exploded, because now today you're using app on your phone. And, and the simple fact is, 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 as I think about getting older, I think about the fact that when my children are ready to take my car away from me someday, the fact is that's probably going to be okay because I'm gonna be able to utilize something else to get me from point A to point B, and it's gonna be some form of a transportation network company. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to getting my Waymo subscription or, or whatever. Yep. Um, thank you. Uh, the the uh, a, a third uh, item, uh, on the menu was uh, one that I think a lot of people were expecting was the uh, electric vehicle tax and yep. uh, hybrid vehicle tax. Um, the, the counter to that is going to be, you know, aren't, aren't those vehicles uh, good for the environment, good for global warming, all that uh, that kind of stuff. So have you, have you heard that criticism and what, 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 what's the response? Yeah, we have to a degree, and and we knew that would be a lip scrimmage around it. So there was there was no no doubt that 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 debate was going to come. I, I think the primary reason that that we resided there is one we're back to the user pay principle, and that is if I'm driving my jeep to work in the morning, or or my neighbor's driving their Tesla, they're wearing out the road to the same degree that I am, and I think we just we simply have to be prepared to assure we're about that notion of, of broader equity. And that, and I think we're recognizing too, we're simply going to see more electric vehicles on the roads. And part of what I think we're, we're particularly sensitive to is if your neighborhood is like mine, if I'm going home to grab a bite of lunch or in the evening, you know, I'm seeing whether it's Amazon or UPS or FedEx or somebody, I'm seeing those vehicles on my street in sheer numbers like we've never seen before. And by the way, they're there early, they're there late, and they're there in the middle. And increasingly, what we're thinking is those fleets will likely start becoming electrified as well. And, and again, that we want to make sure, and that, that was in one of the other recommendations, to the extent that we can find a way, whether it's through a bill of lading or otherwise, back to the efficiency aspects that you spoke of, Joe, um, we recognize there's a public policy toward protecting the environment and we want to celebrate that. At the same time, we recognize we have something relative to this infrastructure system that if we're not paying into it, um, we're gonna find ourselves very quickly in an unattractive spot. Uh, the the uh, uh, proposed fee on e-commerce vehicles uh, I guess a concern there would be that it, it creates a bit of a uh, unlevel playing field uh, with e-commerce compared to their brick and mortar competitors. Well, I, I, I guess part of what we're going to see, I think, is probably a lot of omni-channel activity anyway. Here, here's what I think is going to happen. Um, retail is going to survive in ways I think people are underestimating right now because people are going to want goods. They're still going to want to touch and feel them and see them oftentimes before they order them. Uh, at the same time, if you're thinking about what retail is doing in local communities by employing people, by, have, by paying real estate taxes and everything else that goes with that business, and how long distance is simply not doing that, particularly if it's evolving to EVs, you know, we, we felt like, again, there was fundamental fairness there. Um, I think we keep coming back to the notion, Joe, that we said before, none of these answers are easy. And, and that's Part of the dilemma that elected officials are going to have, and, and that means they're going to have to make some calls on these things at some point in the future. And, and when they make the calls, somebody's going to be unhappy with the call, and somebody's going to be happy with the call, and somebody's going to be somewhat ambivalent about it. And what, what I think we have to be is principled in our conversation, principled in the debate, and then be resolute in the decision and recognize, again, we're making what we feel like is going to be a long-term decision for the best interests of North Carolina. 
and then we're going to have to score and move. Yeah, it, there's no, or it's going to be tough to sugarcoat that for the for the yeah, elected. It's, 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 it's going to be what it's going to be, but but status quo doesn't work. Uh, the the long-term recommendation that the uh, main one that jumps off the page is the uh, mileage-based uh, user fee. Yes. It's, uh, it's, uh, the old M, they call it. I, I'm sorry? The M buff, as people like to refer to it. Mileage-based. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. I'm going to start adopting that. Uh, the M buff. Um, and, you know, it, it's been on the way for 20 years or so, and it's been in the textbooks for longer than that, but um, uh, the, the efficiency argument is really the one I think that's that's won so far and held it, held it back that, you know, that, that all, all of us would need some kind of a gadget in our vehicles uh, to, to somehow track our mileage or, it, you know, it's, it, so it's the, the legend is it's hard to collect. Yeah, the, you know, it's going to be interesting because I, I do think several things in that. One, I think the overall view is technology is likely to be our friend in that. I think that's going to help certainly with the efficiency of it. I think from a policy perspective, if we're back to the notion of users ought to pay, the more miles you drive, the more you wear out the roads, the more you ought to pay for it. Um, if you think about a gas tax, people who burn a lot of gas pay a lot, pay, a lot, pay more in. Uh, so the notion is the more miles you drive, the more you should pay in. What we ran into really was twofold. One, what is the efficiency of it? To your point, Joe, how, how do you collect it? And the other was some heartfelt privacy concerns. People feel like, you know, goodness gracious, do I have a big brother follow me around? I, I guess a, a quick, though not terribly thoughtful response to that is if, if you think big brother isn't following you around right now today anyway, you're, you're kidding yourself. Um, if we go back and, and look at the way the government determined how COVID came into the United States, watching cell phones and where people are coming from, they know where you are. Um, at the same time, if we look at the way the European Union is protecting privacy today relative to mobile apps and otherwise, I think there are good ways that we can protect privacy and what's going on. Part of what we're particularly interested in are vehicles that can tell you how many miles you've driven in North Carolina. I mean, there are people who live in South Carolina and Virginia who come to work every day in North Carolina. And we, we would like to have some degree of, of capturing revenue from the people who are doing that. Um, equally, part of what we're referencing relative to the MBOP is to, to have some volunteer programs that people could use, particularly relative to electric vehicles and otherwise. We thought that that would be a, a, an efficient, thoughtful, effective uh, introduction to it. The other thing that we, that we put in the report is North Carolina does have an annual inspection that's required on your vehicles every year. So you're pulling into an inspection station just like I am at that wonderful sign up, official inspection station. And they're gonna give you your, your license to, to go and get a new registration each year. Um, we've had the technology in place to actually record one year what your mileage is and the next year record what it is so you can calculate the difference. Um, that hasn't always been, people haven't stuck with that because there was this notion that if we did someday might, people might charge us for miles. Um, again, I think we're back to that point of we're gonna have to make some hard decisions uh, but but I think there are ways to make sure that we're counting the miles without violating people's privacy. The other thing that we've considered is rather than having people under those circumstances, for example, pay an entire fee when they go in to get their annual mileage, can it be part of the state tax return and, and that paperwork goes in, maybe pay a quarterly, monthly or otherwise. Again, all of these notions keep coming back to that concept of fundamental fairness because you want to make sure you're not taking any one particular segment of the population and putting them in a particular hardship that just feels unfair. So I, I do think in the fullness of time, and I'm not sure what that means, by the way, in, in terms of time, but it's almost inconceivable that we won't see either at a federal level 
for increasingly at state levels, the concept of mileage-based user fees. If we go back over time and look at how many states were at least running pilot programs in that dimension a decade ago, very few. If you look at how many are today, I want to say about 27 different states are looking at it today. Many of them, in fairness, in the Western United States, where you've got fewer people and you have people driving very, very long distances. But again, if we're looking at Oregon, if we're looking at places like Nevada and others, they recognize that from, back to your view, an efficiency perspective and from a technology perspective and from a fundamental fairness perspective, it is something that needs to be uh, in that state of menus from which we choose. And, and one more follow-up on the MBUF of that acronym, uh, is, is the uh, notion of, of how, how would we get to out-of-state vehicles? Uh, the, somebody, you know, not, not registered in the state, and that, that proportion actually might grow in time with, with more fleets, uh, Waymo and Tesla and whoever else. So any thoughts on that? No, I, I we clearly have some thoughts on that, and, and some of it would be how you would be tracking the vehicles, looking at license plate numbers or others as they come in and out of North Carolina. Again, I, I think what we're likely to see is a transportation or a technology explosion in much of this simply because we have the ability to do things today and tracking that that we haven't in the past. I wish I could give you a, a great quickie answer on that, Joe, but that, that one is one that I think is, is more challenging for us. Very, very good, very good. Uh, one more question, and then we'll uh, see if our participants have uh, lobbed in any questions, which we hope uh, that they have. Uh, uh, any sense of uh, that we have to be careful here that we're not getting too far out ahead of the states with which we compete, especially the surrounding states uh, in the southeast, that if we're uh, getting out there with some of these uh, uh, taxes and fees and they're not. Uh, that, that would put North Carolina at a competitive uh, disadvantage? No, I, I think there's clear sensitivity to that. Um, if we look at what Virginia did several years ago, they, they clearly migrated more to a broader sales tax. They lowered the gasoline tax. South Carolina has a lower gas tax. At the same time, they put in pennies for progress in South Carolina that gives different states the ability to, to leverage some of that. Um, equally, they've looked at taking up the gas tax in South Carolina two cents a year uh, over the next three or four years. And, and look at South Carolina historically hasn't been a big state on, in, on any form of tax increases. I mean, you, when you think tax increases, you usually don't have South Carolina come immediately to mind. Um, and I think that was something that really underscored what then Governor Haley and others have seen that needed to be done in that state. So I, I agree with you. We don't want to put ourselves in a position from a tax perspective that we're not competitive, but equally, we have to be in a different place relative to transportation. If, if we simply think about how key our port systems are tying into the roads, which ties into the rail uh, and going from the sea to the mountains here in North Carolina, um, we have burdens, but more importantly, we have opportunities that many other states simply don't. The other thing that we have, if you think about it, is a series of fairly significant population centers across North Carolina. Uh, think how very different we are from Georgia. Now, Georgia and North Carolina from a population perspective don't look that different, but you've got Atlanta and then you have everything else. I mean, that, that's really Georgia. When you're looking at North Carolina and you have Wilmington and you have Newburn and you have the Triangle and you have the Triad and you have Charlotte Mecklenburg and you get to Asheville, that's a very different east to west march than most of our neighboring states have. Even when you're looking at Virginia, you know, you've, you've got a lot of population in Norfolk, Hampton Roads there along the east, east coast of Virginia that tends to be, though, primarily militarily driven. Then you have Richmond in the middle. You have Charlottesville that, that has some activity that's really built around the university. And then you have that northern Virginia, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, almost megalopolis that all, that all comes together. Um, very different issues than North Carolina is faced with. Good, good. Uh, Andy, how, uh, how are we doing on questions? Do you, do you have any um, that? Um, you, yeah, we do have a few. We do have a few questions, and I saw another one just came in. 
Uh, let's see here. So one of the questions that came in relatively early on has to do with equity on that user tax that you were discussing earlier. Uh, we got a question that said, you know, equity, when it comes to the user tax can be very tricky. And this person cited Wake County as an example, saying that a lot of lower income folks have to live outside the city to afford a home or to rent a home. And now they have to drive more to reach their place of work, do other things. So we may actually be putting them at a, at a disadvantage by accident. He wanted to know what your thoughts on that would be. Now, that, look, that's a great question. That's something we looked at very much on the commission. Here's what we found. It, it was fascinating. It, you, um, there are more studies than, than you would ever want to read on the commission website. And part of what we found is rural parts of the state tended to have older vehicles and they had vehicles that weren't getting the same degree of mileage efficiency that more urban cars were. So the view actually was, we did a, a straight up comparison on what's gonna happen in rural North Carolina under an MBOP versus what's happening in rural North Carolina under a traditional gasoline tax. And actually what we found when we studied that surprised us and delighted us all at the same time. And that was, we felt like that was actually going to cut in favor of rural North Carolina, because again, back, back to your point on equity, if you go back to the, the names and, and roles that I've listed off on the people who are on the NC First Commission, you had some people there in urban areas who are very sensitive to the rural circumstance, but we had great representation from rural parts of North Carolina. So again, that was something that we felt strongly enough about that we actually commissioned a study to address that very subject. Another question we had, oh, sorry, sorry, Joe. Yeah, I just wonder if you got another one. Yeah, we got a couple more. Uh, when it comes to that MBUF, and this was this was touched on, but you know, maybe you could elaborate a little more on how that gets applied to users who might be doing the majority of their own driving out of state, kind of the reverse of what you were talking about. We have so many people coming in from out of state. What about folks who live in North Carolina who may work across the state line? Well, and, and we were particularly sensitive to that because we thought about the people who are living in Charlotte who may be driving to Greenville Spartanburg most days. And our view was really what we're wanting to do is capture if you're driving in North Carolina and wearing out the roads here. And so our, our view was you would probably be a perfect person for an MBA uh, pilot. Because for example, if people were simply having to pay mileage based on what uh, your annual inspection would show, then 80% of your driving was out of state and, and whatever the mechanism that was placed in your car was designed so it measured what your driving was in North Carolina, you could end up being a very real beneficiary of that. So, so again, part of our thought process around the pilot program was geared toward those people who might live barely in North Carolina and spend some time in South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, or Virginia. So that's that's a great question. Thank you for it. Great. All right. We had another one come in asking, was there any consideration that was given to recommend lifting the legislative restrictions on local governments to assess to assess those transportation impact fees on new development? as that's done in many other states. I okay. wanted to know, would we look at that in North Carolina? And he says further that you know, it requires legislative approval and only a few municipalities, at least in the Triangle area, have that approval and that came some time ago. Right, it did come some time ago and, and, and part of what we heard loud and clear, as you can imagine, if we have uh, public officials, including mayors on, on, on that commission, uh, they're very sensitive to what can we do in a local community to do that. Your, your point is spot on, and that is that too will end up being a legislative issue. Uh, but our view was we needed to have some broad based policy reasons or, or avenues for the state to address these. And within them was the notion of some degree of latitude. And, and, and we left this open to a degree, whether it was on a city basis, a county basis, or even taking the state and dividing it up into areas. For example, if, if you look at North Carolina, you'll know the DOT will have a series of DOT divisions across the state. 
you also know that even as we look at emergency management in North Carolina, it's going to be broken down to, the, to a series of districts or divisions. So the notion was we, we weren't going to be prescriptive on what the real estate needed to look like, but giving some degree of mechanism that local counties, cities, areas, municipalities, or others could do that and have the dollars protected part of what we discussed and, and something that we are suggesting that uh, the legislative branch and the executive branch will get together. Fantastic. Um, Andy, do you want to done with our other um, agenda item here? Uh, sure. You know, one of one of the other things that came in here, and I, I personally want to echo this, you know, on behalf of everybody here, Joe Malazzo dropped a, not a question, but just a statement in the Q&A, you know, giving, giving kudos to Ward for all of his leadership and communication when it comes to this. You know, it's, it's involved a lot of hard work, as you said, by a lot of people, but we want to, you know, thank you on behalf of Nick Side for, you know, coming and speaking with us today and for all the work that you and the rest of the commission have done on this. Well, look, th thank you very much for that. Um, we're all North Carolinians at the end of the day. I think we all recognize this is a, this isn't just home. This is a tremendous state that has a future ahead of us that is extraordinary. And I, I think we recognize that we're willing to put our money where our mouth is literally on, on some of these issues. And I'm, I'm very grateful for your graciousness and, and your, and your comments. Thank you so much. I'm turning things over to uh, Josh first at this point, I believe uh, Josh is the, uh, 2020 Nick site president, my, my predecessor. Uh, I see Josh uh, coming up on the screen now. There we go. Yes, hello. The, um, thank you, Joe. The, um, so I, I wanted to, um, so yeah, I'm uh, Josh Hurst. I was the president in, um, of Nick site last year and um, before we wrap up, I, I do want to take this opportunity to present the 2020 Nick Site Contribution to Transportation Award. We, we weren't able to present this at our annual meeting in November, but we want to take some time to acknowledge this now. The, um, the Contribution to Transportation Award is given annually to an individual who has contributed significantly to transportation through professional and or political activities. Uh, to provide some context, uh, recent recipients of this award have included Representative uh, John Torbett, Bobby Lewis, Gene Conti, Sig Hutchinson, William Brawley, Jim Trogdon, Joe Hummer, uh, John Brantley, and uh, then Mayor of Charlotte, Pat McCrory. The, uh, the 2020 recipient of the Contribution to Transportation Award goes to Mr. Ward Nye. Acknowledging uh, your leadership in co-chairing the uh, NC First Commission and its in-depth assessment and plan for providing a long-term successful infrastructure network for North Carolina. So uh, congratulations, Ward, and thank you for your hard work on this commission and for your contributions to the future of transportation in North Carolina. So thank you very thank much. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I, I, I will tell you, I, I, you You've taken me by surprise. I was not ready for that. And you have a partner in crime because as you were saying this, my assistant walked in with it. And uh, and, and typically she can't keep secrets from me. So she and I are gonna have a conversation <laughs> later today. But I, I'm, I'm very grateful for this and very touched by it. And and again, just thank you so much for this. And and I hope this goes along with the evaluation for today and that we'll come through this week. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you very much. We're excited excited that it, it uh, was able to remain a surprise, and but certainly definitely want to recognize um, your accomplishments and your contributions. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, right, I'll turn thank, it back over to you, Joe. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, uh, Nancy was our uh, co-conspirator in this. So, uh... <laughs> well, she, she's a good co-conspirator. I mean, you know, I, I have the title chairman and CEO at Martin Marietta. I know where the power really is, and it's in the office right over there, and it's, it's with Nancy Little. So let's not get ourselves. We appreciate that. Um, just uh, uh, we're, we're getting close to our time here. A uh, couple to, to wrap up. Um, it, it, is the commission essentially done now, or, or where, where does the commission go from here? You know what, our, our work is done relative to the report. Our work is done relative to the recommendations and the options. Our work is not done relative to let's help get something done. 
So I think we're back to that concept that we were talking about a little while ago, Joe, and that is we all have a duty now to be thoughtful advocates because we know doing nothing is, is not a good option. And what I would ask your, your members on the online today to do is read the PowerPoint version. I'm not gonna kid myself. It's, it's gonna be a real transportation nerd that reads that, that full report. But if you read the PowerPoint version and decide, you know, what are the ones here that I really believe in? And then put some advocacy behind that. That's where the commission is right now. And, and we're gonna be having conversations at local levels, but also at the state level to try to, to make real progress on what we've recommended. And uh, I would say from Nick Seitz's point of view, let us know if we can help. Oh, uh, don't you worry. We, we will. <laughs> please, please do. I, I, I know you've got good, good contacts among our members, uh, some of whom help, help set this up. Uh, but uh, you know, for, from me, from the board, uh, and from our, uh, I think at this point, over, over 500 members, you know, we, we're certainly invested in this. And, and so uh, keep us in mind and, and let us know. Don't, don't, don't hesitate to ask. Um, we, we uh, you know, sh share or, or you know, more, more than that, uh, want, want this to succeed going forward. So uh, anything I missed? Anything else, uh, point, points you'd like to make? Or? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I, I think what we've talked about is what a, what a vision for North Carolina can be going forward. And we're all tied to that future of North Carolina. And we, we can make it better, we can make it safer, we can make it more efficient, and we can get ready for a wave of people that are going to continue coming here. Anyone in the recent years who's tried to travel through Atlanta can get a good sense of what not, being, not planning carefully for the future can do to a community. And that's not what we want to see happen in major parts of our state. Let's, let's, let's not do that. Yep, very good, very good. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Ward. Uh, thank you to our, again, uh, sponsors, uh, our uh, diamond, diamond sponsors, uh, uh, eight fine companies who uh, stepped up uh, for, for Nick site and made all this possible. We really appreciate that. Uh, thank you to the Strategic Initiative Council. Thank you to the Young Members Council. And uh, thank you to uh, Andy, uh, a producer. I don't know, got to work on a, a better title, but... Uh, We'll figure it out. Uh, don't forget to, uh, to uh, fill out your uh, evaluation uh, and to uh, that, that gets you your PDH uh, certificate for, for uh, today's experience. Uh, our next conversation in transportation will be in, in uh, early to mid-April. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, settled on a guest or time or date quite yet, but uh, we will come out with an announcement soon uh, when we do that. And uh, we hope that you join us then for that. Um, so uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, this is Joe Hummer and uh, I've appreciated doing this. Uh, look forward to uh, see you again in a couple months, if not before. Take care, everybody. Take care and stay safe. Thank you, Joe. Thanks everyone. <laughs>